Welcome, I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review. Welcome to Critical Questions Live, Is It Up to Business to Save the Planet? Just weeks ago, the United States, excuse me, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change forcefully elucidated the immediate existential threats to our warming planet. In a momentous, alarming report, the IPCC's panel of scientists warned that if greenhouse gas emissions continue at the current rate, the atmosphere will warm by as much as 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels by 2040, resulting in flooded coastlines, the destruction of the world's coral reefs, and increased wildfires, droughts, and food shortages. What is required, the panel urged, is nothing less than the transformation of the global economy at an unprecedented scale and with unprecedented speed. The technology might exist to forestall many of these dire effects, but at this time, the political will does not. The US is the world's second largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China, but President Donald Trump is a climate change skeptic who poo-pooed the findings of the IPCC report in part by citing the fact that his uncle John Trump was a great professor at MIT for many <laughs> years. We're so proud. He added, I didn't talk to him about this particular subject, but I have a natural instinct for science. <laughs> in addition to eliminating a host of federal environmental regulations, the Trump administration intends to withdraw the United States from the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. Given that government is abdicating its responsibility, is it up to business to step in? At this apparently pivotal juncture in human history, should a company's top priority be serving its shareholders, providing jobs, or saving the planet? And are these priorities necessarily at odds? For the next hour, we'll wrestle with these questions with the help of two of the leading voices in the sustainability debate. Yossi Sheffi is the Alicia Gray II Professor of Engineering Systems at MIT and Director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. He is the author of four books, the most recent of which is Branding, Balancing Green, When to Embrace Sustainability in a Business and When Not to. Andrew Winston is a globally recognized expert on how companies can navigate and profit from humanity's biggest challenges. He is the founder of Winston Eco Strategies and the author, author of three books, most recently, The Big Pivot, Radically Practical Strategies for a Hotter, Scarcer, and More Open World. Welcome to you both, to our audience here at MIT's Killian Hall, and to everyone watching on our live stream. We'll be leaving time for Q&A at the end of the discussion. If you are joining us online, you can submit as well as upvote questions at any point during the program by visiting mitsmr.com planet. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Gentlemen, let's dive right in. And Andrew, uh, the first question is coming to you. Donald Trump justifies government inaction on climate change by saying he doesn't want to damage the US economy. That fighting global warming will come at the expense of jobs, business, and growth. My question is, is that a false premise? Moral questions aside, is climate change good or bad for business? So we're starting with simple questions first. Okay. And I, it's only downhill from yeah. there. And, uh, and I love that you had you know, the guts to start with the words Donald Trump as the beginning of the first question. Um, I, I don't think we want to spend a lot of time you know, on particular you know, politicians, but I will say it's, it's not just him. There's kind of been a longstanding view, um, mostly from one party. I think that's just factual. I mean, you see uh, Senator Rubio on TV a lot saying, yes, I care about this for my state in Florida, um, but I don't want to destroy the economy. That's been one of the lines on climate for a long time. I, I, I mean, the easy answer is that's kind of ridiculous. Um, there's a much more subtle kind of answer that probably will take some time over the course of this, this hour. But I'll just say there's, I think, two kind of big fatal flaws with that logic. I mean, one is that it always seems to ignore the cost of doing nothing, as if if we just keep going, there's no cost to the economy. And there's plenty of studies. Um, the hippies over at Citibank a couple years ago came up with a, a pretty detailed analysis of, of what happens to the global economy if we do not tackle carbon, if we do not reduce carbon in, in the um, economy. And they didn't start from if there's climate change. They just said, well, of course, this is an issue. And roughly speaking, they said between now and the middle of the century, it'll cost $72 trillion to the, to the economy if we don't deal with this. 
Um, the World Bank came out with a study around the same time that said coastal assets at risk from rising sea levels was 150 trillion. Now, I have an economics degree from college. I have an MBA not from here, but from another you know, nice school in, in the northern part of uh, Manhattan. Uh, and I can tell you that those numbers round up to, I think, about infinite. That's kind of the technical term I use, uh, meaning these are systemic risk kind of numbers. We're talking about such a big uh, challenge to the economy that to pretend that um, there's no cost to doing nothing is kind of ridiculous. The other fatal flaw is just that there's clearly jobs and growth in the clean economy. It's already much bigger than the fossil fuel economy. That, that point happened over the last few years. There are millions of people in the what's called the advanced energy economy already in this country. And there's like 80,000 coal miners, um, 50,000 who go you know, underground. And there's millions doing other things like solar panels and wind. So it, it's this very bizarre argument um, about destroying the economy when I think very clearly the IPCC report tells us that we are facing devastating losses to our economy and our lives and our well-being if we do nothing. Thank you, Yoshi, your response? Yeah, uh, first I'd like to, um, maybe people miss part of your question. The question, the part of the question that I saw was uh, talk about if we ignore the moral side of the, you know, of the question, implying that there is a moral side. Uh, and that's, that's the biggest problem and the biggest fallacy, seeing things, because the minute that you said that it is moral to do something about uh, climate change, about poverty, about uh, you know, whatever you want, you put the other side as immoral, unethical, stupid, whatever you want to call it. And this closes the, um, any reasonable discussion right there. And by the way, I'm sure that people didn't notice here because Look at it, and aside from a few of my students, everybody probably agree with you that it's more. But <laughs> I was trying to inoculate my students to this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first issue. It's not a moral issue. It is an issue of, you know, call it stochastic, you know, probability, or just probability in the future versus cost today. Interestingly, you say Marco Rubio, you know, President Trump, Donald Trump, they represent the will of the majority of the US. The point is that companies cannot take the lead. And by the way, not only cannot, should not. And they should not because the issue is their customers. Some examples, you know, uh, McDonald came out and said they're gonna ban plastic straws. A ridiculous statement. <laughs> that doesn't move the needle, doesn't do anything. If they really want to move the needle, they should stop selling beef. That is a big impact on emission. Now, would they do it? If they'll do it, of course, somebody else will sell beef. The question is, they cannot stop selling beef unless the customers will demand to not eat beef. So putting it on government, Government actually, as far as I can tell, reflects the will of the people, reflects the belief of, uh, of people. Not all the people. Andrew is not part of this. But there are, there's a large part of people. It's not that, they, in, in the research for my book, it is not. It's a fallacy to say that executives and CEOs don't believe in climate change deniers. It's not it. They just think that the actions that people are asking to do do not justify the cost of doing this. The cost in jobs, the cost in standard of living, the cost of dislocation, they just don't believe in it. So, and this is the reason that they are doing the minimum they should bring of some eliminating plastic straws or putting you know, bicycle racks in front of the entrance and saying this will help uh, climate change, but it's more of a fig leaf. You know, not doing what really needs, needs to be done. We can talk about what yeah. could and should be done, but most of the actions suggested that companies will take on, that consumers will start separating the trash. You know, household trash is 3% of US waste. And out of the 100, out of 300 million uh, people in the United States, five probably all live in Cambridge, actually separate the trash very, very religiously. So it doesn't move the needle, it's a joke. So that's why I'm saying until consumers and customers will start be willing to demand it, will start paying for it, will are be willing to um, 
sustain some inconveniences, nothing will happen and shouldn't. Well, the problem, I think, Yossi, is that we don't know when that will be. And one might interpret what you're saying as letting business off the hook to try to even encourage that type of sentiment. And the longer we delay taking action, and we means all of us, government, individuals, business, the more muscular and disruptive the eventual policy reactions will need to be. So given this, doesn't it make sense for business to get on the right side of history now? As you can say, it's two against one here. He's <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> he, he's supposed to be the moderator. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you should have heard the background conversation. But, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> but uh, makes me feel good. It takes two against one. Well, I'm one curious what you think it. my position is. You think it's two against one. I don't know if we know. I want to come back to my question we'll, first. We'll come, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to I want to know what my position is today. I can go wherever we want to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's, it's uh, uh, his own business to do it. Why? It's not. Let me get. One would say, if anything, it's government. And I'm not talking about the current government in, uh, uh, in the United States, which may be, several people hope, a short-time operation. But anyway, that's not, that's not the issue. Take the government like Germany. The Green Party is running it. Germany, in the constitution of Germany, committed to growth. Politicians have to, have to be committed to growth. Germany, with the green parties, with everything, did not reduce in the last decade any of its emissions. And Germany is not going to meet the Paris goals. It's clear. So the government is not going to do it. Consumers are not willing to do it. Why do we want business? Who is people in, invest in business in order to make, to make a return. There are businesses that do it. There are what's called benefit corporations, business, businesses who are dedicated to uh, social causes, social environmental causes. These are usually uh, legal professions, accounting professions, small companies that don't do anything anyway. But it's good for them, they feel good. It's part of the feel good. It's like separating the trash. It's part of feeling good. So they, they do it. There's no large business, General Motors, or, or McDonald's, or Procter & Gamble. Uh, what I'm telling them when I'm talking to board, absolutely talk about it. Just make sure you don't do too much. Hmm. But you can talk about it, absolutely. Can I ask, can I break can the I, format and ask a question? I, <laughs> Please. I'm curious, you just said the, the government's uh, not go. doing it, consumers are not doing it, and then I think that answers your question about why business has to do it, frankly. That's one of the reasons I would say is because the other two maybe aren't. But then who is? Are you saying, why, why have this discussion? Why get out of bed if no one's gonna do it? Uh, the IPCC report is very clear, if no one's gonna do it, we're facing very, very ah, devastating so before times. You, so, who, so what's the I, answer? Gonna, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. You need to talk some more first. Sure, OK. Um, I, I love talking. I okay. think <laughs> what, what, what Yossi is suggesting is that it's irrational to, act, to expect organizations right. to act irrationally. Yeah. Right? And if a, if a business can't size a positive opportunity to, to act more sustainably, if, if in fact they're actually running against right. their own best interest, how, isn't it an is, it, is it then an unreasonable expectation? Yeah, if, if you define it in a way that makes it look like it's against their interest, I don't think that's true. I mean, first of all, um, I, I agree with a great deal of what you said, I think. Oh, uh, don't I, say this. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but because I, I, I'm, you know, you know how they say you should give a, a feedback sandwich nice? Yeah, okay. Just <laughs> nice. I'm starting with the nice, starting the with nice, the nice part. Um, Good. I, I, I feel agree, so much better. I agree. The straws are silly. It's it's, but it's something they're doing. And you know, uh, I, I've worked uh, with Marriott for a number of years, and they just banned. They they use a billion straws. It's a lot of straws, but it's a tiny, tiny piece. You know, yes, those are small things in in the end. Um, and I agree that the moral discussion is almost um, irrelevant because this. Uh, you know, I've always taken a very practical approach to sustainability, meaning it's it's literally the word. Do we want to be able to continue doing what we're doing and have a thriving future and exist? So I don't, it is moral, but it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter. Now, I think companies are doing, there's a lot of ground between straws and destroying your business by going green and doing things that are unprofitable. There's a tremendous amount of ground. And the, the range of things that are profitable for business has gotten much, much larger. I mean, there's always been the, the easy wins, cutting energy, lighting retrofits, manufacturing efficiencies, everything under lean is green. But now you've got the entire clean economy, renewable energy area, where it is now cheaper fundamentally to buy renewable energy than fossil fuels pretty much everywhere in the world. 
Um, the, the corporate buys of renewable energy this year were seven gigawatts in the first half of the year. That was already more than the previous year in total. We're on an exponential curve of renewable energy buying in the corporate world, and these are not small numbers anymore. Seven gigawatts is, you know, seven nuclear plants. That was in the first half of the year just corporate buying, which is separate from the amount they buy from the grid that they push the utilities and others to, to buy as well. Um, so there's real stuff going on, and companies are pushing on their supply chains, they're getting more efficient, the buildings are getting more efficient, all these things are real. Um, but, but the gap is whether it's enough. And then you get into, into tougher questions about should companies go faster than the straight ROI of an investment would indicate. Well, so let me interject for okay, a second. Okay, because I, I have a lot to say about that. I'm sure you do. Yeah. Sure. Um, of course. Is it enough? Right? You said the question is, well, now answer the question. Well, no, of course it's not. I mean, we're not even close. I mean, the IPCC report, and frankly, there's been a number of scientific reports that have come out in the last month that have been um, just really bad. I mean, I, you know, they've, they've been um, indications of ecosystems in complete and utter decline. Um, just in the last couple of months, there's been reports about coral, um, kelp forests, insect populations, um, all in rapid decline today. Um, the world is clearly getting less rich for us and for our children, um, and climate is one of the biggest reasons for this, in addition to us using land and just growing as a, as a species. Um, so it isn't enough. It clearly is, and it wasn't to begin with. The, the Paris Climate Accord would still get us to something like, if countries met it, three degrees Celsius, which I don't think we know is survivable. Let's, uh, we have to be really honest. We're at one degree now, and these are not linear effects. We don't know where the tipping points are, which is, which is the long run risk aversion logic for everything on climate, which is we don't know where the tipping points are. And I know that I spend some percentage of my income and, and, and wealth on insurance, not because I know I'm gonna drop dead tomorrow, but because it could happen, and I want my family to be okay. And, and there's just an, an insurance mentality about this at the global level. So we're clearly not doing enough, but let me just say quickly on the ROI thing. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that in business we define ROI so narrowly that we actually miss out on the things that are valuable to business, and not to externalities, not to the polar bears, not to, not to the rainforest, but value to business in the intangibles, the intangibles that make up something like 80% of the S&P 500 market value, the things that are not on the books, employee loyalty, customer loyalty, innovation, resilience, risk reduction, et cetera, et cetera, so that the investments we make when we just count cash and say, should we do X investment because it'll pay back in two years, is ignoring an amazing amount of return that fall under other buckets that are real business value. And we really are not good at measuring that. But calling it zero isn't very good either. And so there's this gap. And I think we could be making many more investments in business that would take longer than the 18 or 24 month um, to pay back, but have other value that's real. Thank you. So Yossi, let's talk about the risks of not taking bolder action if you're a business, particularly through the lens of the next generation of, of um, of your customers. So one of the points you made is that consumers have not demonstrated the willingness to pay a premium for green products, and I think that's well proven or, out. Or inconvenience. Or uh, I, exactly. They're, they're, they're not willing to sacrifice not um, willing wh to whatever sacrifice. it is. But one has to wonder whether that's going to hold um, and how long it's going to hold. You've got, a, you've, got, you've got new generations of consumers beginning to wield significant financial power. Um, and so I guess I, what I'm looking for is your take on both the opportunity with millennials, um, with, I mean, we'll put this, it's not purely an age thing, and I recognize that, but it's also kind of an age thing. Sure, sure, it is. Um, both the opportunity, but also the risk, the risk that you're gonna be punished if you don't get ahead of the curve. Okay. Underlying both the treaties of, of Andrew and your question, also coming from that side, <laughs> is that, <laughs> <laughs> is the fact that, is the assumption that the business executives are moron, deplorable, don't know how to run the business, don't know what's good for the business, and, but we know. We know how they should run the business because we are smart, we are the elite, we are, we are not Marco Rubio, we know, we know what's good for them. Now, all executives, all CEOs are, you know, their remuneration is based on stock, is based on performance, based, and we say, hey, guys, don't pay any attention to this. You should sacrifice your own future and don't look at ROI, but look at other things that are, by the way, I take, uh, I know the argument that there are things that are not, um, that you cannot account for, that they are not in the financial statement. 
I question if they exist. And you say zero is not? No, point 0.1, OK. I mean, for that, all those categories. For all those Employee categories. Employee loyalty, customer loyalty, Employee resilience, loyalty, risk color. reduction, point 0.1. All right, well, I'm just saying where, where you are in the number. Point okay. 0.2. Point 0.2, <laughs> OK. <laughs> what, uh, why? You just doubled, you know. I just doubled, you doubled I, it. <laughs> As, as a service to both of you. I hear point two I mean, is 20% of the value of the enterprise. So that's pretty good. Uh, this is a fascinating no, no, no. rhetorical it's point technique. It's point two percent. Anyway, <laughs> come, come here back. Now oh, I lost my train. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't have jumped in. I just wanted to clarify uh, where we were. Point two. That's where we two. were. Point two. Is, uh, the value of the, uh, of the, again, what you're saying is that the executive who run the business don't know it, don't understand it. I would argue that a successful corporation, successful on the traditional ROI, when people get stock options, employee loyalty is very high. Otherwise, why would anybody give stock options? So you have companies, I don't see mass defection from Facebook because they, let's say, I don't know how to do technical terms, screwed up the election or yeah. something mm -hmm. like this. Uh, I don't see mass defection because stock option makes money. People have ec economics drive everything. So. You, we can talk about the fact that what the world should be like. And on this, we actually agree. Mm. But what I'm saying is, it's utopia. We can talk about what should be, it, but we better talk about what is, how the world actually work, how consumers actually behave. We do a study now. In Massachusetts, on, Ms. Jonas here, mm -hmm. do a, a study of consumers buying of sustainable product. So there's Stop and Shop in Malden. I, several Stop and Shop, we do it in many stores, but I, I went to Malden. There are aisles that have green product and next to it, regular product. Paper product, the detergent, uh, the, the, it clearly mentioned with big green signs, these are the green products and all this. They include not only sustainable product, but uh, healthy product mm -hmm. in addition. The Molden stores make $1.2 million a week. Out of this, the sales of all this product is $20,000 a week. Mm. People are just not putting their money where their mouth is. I mean, it's, so it's, and it's not even in like 50%. It's nothing. Mm. So, and as long as consumers are not, and by the way, when you talk about consumers, consumers are the people who invest in companies, who own the companies. So you want executive to act I don't know the interest to act against what their consumers are actually actually want, what their owners actually want. Talk about immoral. This is immoral. So unethical. At, at, a, at an individual level, at scale, if that even makes sense, Yossi, you're you're arguing that that it is in few people's best interest um, to change business as usual. That's a negative phrase, and I don't mean it that way. Yeah. But if individual executives and organizations aren't incentivized, if consumers aren't convinced, where does that leave us? I mean, in the end, if individual interests aren't being served, the, the needle never gets moved. Organizations are just made up of individuals. That's correct. Um, there's, I don't know where to start, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think, um, I don't think anybody, whatever side you're imagining here, I don't think anybody's saying that we know better than, um, than the executives. What I'm saying is that um, and I do think executives know that there's, there's intangible value and there's other things they're trying to build. What I'm saying is the tools for um, measuring that are not very evolved, even though there's been decades of discussion in places like MIT. And there's people in the room I know who work on these issues, like how do you measure the things that are hard to measure. I think your estimate of how the value of that is would be a shock to all the CEOs who stand up and say their number one asset is people, um, uh, considering people is actually a cost on the balance sheet, not an asset. They say that, and they mean it, and the talent race But how do you incentivize real. the people, with money or with talk about loyalty? Both. Well, intrinsic and extrinsic. Let me just say that there is a fundamental difference generationally today with the people coming out of business school today on wanting and seeking a value and an ethic in where they're working. Not all of them, not every single person, but on average, and the reason I think is very fundamental uh, my father worked for IBM for 35 years. I think he's watching right now. Hi, Dad. Uh, uh, Hi, Mr. Winston. Yes. And um, uh, there was a deal. He still gets a pension. He, he still gets something called um, that you might have heard of called a pension that people used to get. 
long about the time millennials were born, that contract and deal was shattered, and companies stopped offering any kind of lifetime deal or employment. And so I think it makes sense that you have a generation that says, I'm in it for myself, whatever that means. I'm just looking for val the value, and that means both pay and something I believe in. Um, and when I talk to the companies I work with and executives, and they'll say things like, well, millennials really care. And I want to agree with you that on the consumption level, surveys show they care and they'll buy more green. The percentage of people who pay more for green or whatever is single digits, has been forever. Part of that's whether you can pay more, right? Um, but where there is a difference is this generation um, as employees. That pressure point, I have heard this repeatedly from company after company, and when I, I asked one CEO, how do you know that millennials um, care about this stuff? He said, well, they tell me. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, when I go to different facilities, they just come up because millennials have no boundaries, and they just, <laughs> they just come up and start talking to them. I'm so glad we're doing this in our supply chain. Now, let me tell you what we're doing here. They care about this, and, and I see companies um, really truly believe that there's a talent, there is a talent war, um, that there is fundamentally a shortage of the kind of people they want in very, very fundamental uh, roles in, in businesses, and they believe this does drive value. Um, so I don't think this, this additional value that is unmeasured is small at all. I think it's, um, in many sectors, it's enormous. But we're having kind of a theoretical conversation about what's a very practical problem, which is the climate and the, and the potential you know, end of, of humanity, um, not to put so much of a thing on yeah, it, but the problem is that we, um, everything we've just described, it, it brings out the fundamental flaw in our system, which is we do not know how to handle systemic value or systemic risk or shared value and shared risk, because yes, the incentives for an individual company to act on a shared problem, if they can't kind of see clear to some of this intangible value, the incentives are low. And so what that means is you don't tackle a shared problem like climate. I mean, let's be clear, climate is the perfectly designed problem for humanity to fail at. Um, it, is, it is like the final exam, whether we can come together and find a way to incentivize individuals and individual organizations for what is a, a shared common good issue. This is the tragedy of the commons writ large at the, at the ultimate scale. Let me just, I see Yossi scribbling notes, just so go respond, ahead. Let yeah. respond to some of this. Um, I agree, it's the tragedy of the commons. It, it's not, th th that's not the question we're talking about. You go back and back into how bad the problem is, I agree. How it's a tragedy of the common and together, I agree it's difficult. The difference between us is you see, you seem to be a little more optimistic than I am, in fact, because uh, only I know, on camera. In, in, <laughs> only on camera. Uh, in the 60s, we had uh, in this country a very you know, socially conscious young environment. Mm. They grew up to become Republicans. This generation of Democrats will also grow up to become Republicans. So it's, and, and, and even worse. Today's Republicans. So, so it's, a, um, it's not clear that this uh, generational wave uh, will take place. And we forget completely something, as, as it you say, is at the heart of the problem. Consumers in the rich world, you know, US, Europe, Japan, uh, top of China, whatever, are not willing to pay more or be inconvenienced. Two-thirds of humanity live in places they cannot afford it, mm -hmm. for whom it's a luxury good. So, so let me try to get at, at the only solution. that I, There are two solutions. That I actually, I'm, I'm actually dying to hear what you're saying. Dying solution. to hear okay. I am. Because you've, you've pointed out that every possible sector is uninterested. So who, who's going to bring it? Uninterested. Okay. Absolutely uninterested. There are two possible solutions. Uh, it's all require coming together. But this one solution is stopping growth. Stopping growth means in a world that every country is measured, measured on GDP growth, every CEO is measured on company growth, mm -hmm. every person wants more and more stuff. Mm -hmm. And by the way, as an aside, we have to uh, control population as part of this. So we, and we have to tell all the people in Africa and Asia that they think about air conditioning, just to forget it, it's not gonna happen. And uh, use concrete for building, uh, it's not for you. This approach is immoral and unethical. So what, what's left? To me, the only thing that's left is accurate technology. And not only because we're at MIT, but I'm thinking about, instead of the Paris Agreement when we had 
uh, agreement that nobody enforces, and, and or very few people enforce. And I'll give the example of Germany, you know, with all the Greens and all, but many other countries that don't really even work. You know, the only country that actually reduces its, its emissions is the United States, mm. by 14 percent because because of technology, because of the fracking and gas, mm. using using gas instead of coal. Mm. So the United States, with all the when when European by the way hear it, they don't believe it. I had several, like I several like, talking in Europe, and I said, who is the country that reduces emission more than anything? They all say Germany. When you start from a lot, reducing is easier. But no, be, it's, I mean, not, it's not. It's it, not. It is. Because you, you, are lo you are locked into a standard of living, right. and it's very hard to take away, but technology can do it. So what I'm, what I'm saying, the solution that I see is an international Manhattan project. Right. Of, instead of doing... Um, you know, uh, uh, agreements that are enforceable, not enforceable, people can cheat on them, people can do, and they not even applicable to, to two-thirds of humanity. What you need to do is the rich countries should build together and find not billion, but trillions of dollars right. worth of research and give, you know, there should be the equivalent of Nobel Prizes for people who will come with it. Get both the... Uh, the accolades and the money and all of this and get it the best universities and the best research institution and come up with solutions that are far out. I mean, geoengineering, uh, carbon sequestration on a, on, on a big scale beyond the small stuff that to me, the small stuff, what people are arguing about, people are saying that you can have green growth, which I don't believe right. exists, it's providing a, green, a fig leaf for companies to do the small stuff and not to do the real change that are required. So, Yossi, let's stay on that for a minute, because I think this is a really interesting part of the conversation. Um, if, we, if we are, first of all, it's very unfashionable to have that kind of blind faith in technology right now, but you, there's certainly basis I, I for tried, a huge... I never try to be fashionable. No, and that's, that's my a wife, wonderful thing my about My wife you. dresses me up. Right. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> that's it. How realistic, given, I guess, I guess the question is this, if you believe the IPCC report or, or buy into any time frame similar to that, how realistic is this kind of broad systemic moonshot-like technology solution, how likely is that to come to fruition soon enough? Okay, so it's very hard since we started with the current administration, it's very hard to think that it will come to, uh, come to being under current administration, but we have two more years. So it's not the end of the world yet, not in two years. The end of the world will come in, what, 20 years or something like this, 30 years. So, so, so we have time. It, it, the, the United <laughs> States, sometime, the United States and the European Union and Japan can get their act together and do something like this. But the question to me is what's the alternative? I don't see an alternative. That's the difference. I don't see an alternative. Mm -hmm. Can I offer that? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, his alternative is business will take the uh, green growth and all this, but it doesn't exist. It's wishful thinking. That's why I'm, 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 I, I, I like what Andrew writes, but it's just, I read it and I say, don't I wish the world will be like this? But it's not. Well, okay, I will say that, um, I didn't think you'd say what you said, um, because what you just described was something that requires an amazing amount of common good governance to have some global moonshot, which I don't know where you're going to get that outside of government, fundamentally. Maybe you can get all the academic oh, no, no, institutions government, coming government, together. In what I thought you were going to say, which is the third alternative that you didn't mention, which is actually using markets, meaning price the hell out of carbon and raise the price aggressively over the next 90 years. And then all of those incentives that you're worried about, the executive and the short-term shareholders, are in line. You price carbon high enough, and every technology that you want that's going to reduce carbon gets cheaper relative to the price of... But oh, wait, let me finish. Let me finish. So the other thing that I want to say about your moonshot um, is that this is... Bill Gates has been out there saying something very similar. We just need this big new technology. We don't... We actually have all the technologies. We have fundamentally all the technologies we need. I work with companies like Ingersoll Rand. You mentioned air conditioning. Let me just tell you, if you guys haven't looked at the stats for projections on air conditioning um, and you don't want to get really, really depressed, just don't. Don't look at it. Economists wrote a couple articles uh, a month or two ago. It's bad. Um, the, as the, the three billion people that live in the warmest bands on the earth, there's like 7% have air conditioning right now. If they all get it, 
everything else we do on meat, on everything else is <laughs> done, just done. But so part of it is a technology solution. Those companies like Ingersoll are developing zero global warming potential cooling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, the moonshot is not really needed when we have things like insulation, we have building design, we have, we have EVs, we have, we're gonna need some things, maybe some new chemistries and batteries and storage because there's probably not enough lithium, but we have a lot of the technologies to start the rapid de-escalation of emissions now. It's about getting them into the field, it's about mobilizing capital, and that again is helped by a very high price on carbon that we scale in, and that requires legislation. So yes, I, I don't think business can do it alone. I think business will have to execute it because business is the actual um, kind of action of the world. It isn't, you know, the government has some big coffers, but fundamentally businesses are doing things. Even governments um, that are paying for military, it's Lockheed, it's not the government, right? It's still companies. I so we need to price things. I should tell you that I write uh, a monthly blog on, uh, uh, influencer monthly blog on, uh, on LinkedIn. And the blog that I got by far the most response was a blog that suggests the U.S. should have European style uh, gas tax, tax on gas. Yeah, they should. Uh, yes, I got the sample of the email I should show you to say, we know where you live. We know where you go to, this was. You never look at the comments online, absolutely. let me just tell you. <laughs> never, that was one of my, one of my okay. main agreements with myself this year was stop looking at comments online. Okay. What, Not I'm saying worth it. Is, what I'm saying is, people feel it's, it, it's just real. When, when you are starting talking about um, pricing transportation much, much higher, transferring home heating, transferring air conditioning, because this is what it will take. It will, it's, it, and by the way, some of the IPC, IPC, I don't know if the IPCC or their uh, comment try to estimate what will be the level of tax. Oh, by 2100, it's it was thousands in, of it's, dollars. It's enormous. Yeah, but that's it's, when you're not using those technologies anymore. By the time you get to that number, you've already phased out those. There's no technology that but, would exist. But that's at that exactly what I'm talking about: right. wishful thinking. So you are saying that there is a technological solution, but we will get there. Some other so wait, way. so a group of universities doing an imaginary Nobel is not wishful thinking? I'm sorry. I think getting a price on carbon around the world is far more likely. Yeah, it's but already it's, happening. But it's not going to solve the problem. And, yep. and when you say if it's high enough, it does. But if it's I believe high, in markets. I have an but, economics degree. I went to schools like this. I believe, but, I believe in it. You don't believe in the markets on this, which is kind of fascinating. I believe, I this no, is no, an no, MIT no, professor. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. don't. <laughs> I, I, I like it. One, one of the way to win a debate is to put word in my mouth. It works, <laughs> but, uh, but let, let me... I've been, I've been eating that for the last half right. hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, the laugh break is my chance to jump back in. I wanted to stay out of the fray. I mean, I, I, um, so backstage, I, um, I warned these guys if they agreed too much that I was going to move my, my, my chair over to the left. Well, thankfully, that hasn't been a problem. Um, <laughs> but we mentioned market. Let's stay on market, but let's, yeah, let's yeah. look at the market from a different side. Let's look at the investment side. We haven't really talked about um, the role of investment and what pressures investment might be able to bring right. um, to this conversation. So, Andrew, I'm going to begin this, this question with you. ESG investing soared after Trump's election. Um, it's premised on the assumption that embedding environmental, social, and governance factors in capital markets makes good business sense and leads to more sustainable markets. And George Kell, chairman of Arabesque, has argued that market-led cha market changes will actually, you know, will, I'm, I'm misquoting him, but essentially getting this right, will act as a force for good on a truly massive scale. Truly massive scale are his words. Is that too optimistic? Are you talking about ESG money driving that force for good? I what's think what the, we're really the... talking about here is, I mean, ESG is, is where this question emanates from, right. but can markets, can markets, can, can the investment side drive this or be a key Well, yeah, I mean, we're this. using markets in two different ways. We the are, markets yeah. I was describing before are just I'm talking pure about, economic I'm, I'm markets, talking right? About, I'm talking okay, investment. the investment, let's just say that the investment community, if you look at, say, 20 stakeholders that might push a company to do anything, the investment community is probably 20th on the, on the list as a force on sustainability and has been. Something's changing though. And, and for the first time, I have now heard for the whole time I've been in this field at every sustainability event, if there's a CEO or someone, they'll just say, Wall Street never asks. And I still, I ask every client, are you, are you hearing this from investors? Something has changed, at least on in the institutional side. There's the big sovereign funds, there's the big state pension funds. Um, but now there's also kind of the passive investors, BlackRock, Vanguard, and I think we should talk about the Larry Fink letter from earlier this year for, for people who didn't see it. Um, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, he's the largest investor in the world, $6 trillion under management. He's done a letter every year for the last four years to S&P 500 CEOs that has basically pushed ESG and said, you gotta think about these issues. Um, 
the first three years were kind of ignored, but this year it landed differently. He said basically you need to have a purpose, you need to have a social purpose, um, you need to be able to explain that to your stakeholders, you need to have a long-term plan, um, and we're gonna keep asking you about this. You need to give us a long-term plan. We could have a lot of debates about how effective that's been because they are passive investors. There's only so much they can do. But I have now heard from clients repeatedly this year, yeah, what, this that Larry Fink thing. We gotta, we gotta be able to explain our purpose to ourselves, to our customers, to our employees. And I'm getting calls just for consulting with big industrial companies to, to ask that question. What's our vision? What's our purpose? The day or two after Larry Fink's letter this year, Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed that said, apparently Larry Fink is now one of these hippies who's unrealistic and doesn't want to make money. Which is, I'm sorry, it was the most absurd thing I've ever seen, even in the Wall Street Journal, which is saying a lot. And the idea that the guy with $6 trillion doesn't want to make money is ridiculous. What he was saying. Maybe it's enough. No, what he's, <laughs> no, not him, for his, for his know, customers. Just kidding. He has plenty. Well, for his customers, what he was saying was that the way companies create value today, their role in society and the way they create value is evolving and changing. And I have now heard that from clients as well, that they are saying the way we create value is, is changing and we have to be able to explain it better and tell a different story than we've told before. So the question is, why does, you know, why does someone like Larry think, think that if this is all bogus? You I'll think he's you. making it up? No, he's not making it up. Yeah. He's not making it up, but he he's doesn't. wrong. But you have to again, have the soft putting words yeah, in each other's yeah, mouth. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> he's not he's not wrong in his own mind. Right. But he does what mm, I would say 95% of companies do. They talk a good game in order to make sure that they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So companies will take initiative. Take for example UPS, one of my favorite companies. Actually, I'm not kidding. It is. Uh, they, uh, a while ago, about 10 years ago, they started developing an app, it's called My Choice, when you can tell the, uh, um, the, uh, the delivery, you can uh, right. uh, direct it to somewhere else right, some right. other time. They did it in order to save costs, because if you, they come to your home and you're not there, they have to deliver three times, that's their commitment. Now, suddenly, in the last year, they said, this is our sustainability practice, mm -hmm. because we don't have to deliver three times. Right. What I'm saying, this is what I advise companies to do. Take whatever makes sense anyway, and make a big deal out of it. Right. So <laughs> you, you can talk. What I'm saying, everybody should talk a good game. In or, for, it's a risk management. It, nobody wants to be attacked by Greenpeace. Nobody wants to be the, the nail that sticks out. So do some minimum, PR the hell out of it, and keep doing what you're doing. That's what most companies are doing, whether they should do or should not do, or whether the moon should or not, that's, that's, what, that's what happens. Let me pick up UPS for a second, though, because there's something really interesting to, about that. I'm going I'm I'm okay. to hit a pause on it, and I right. apologize, because we're, 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 we're over the time before oh, we need yes. to get to All questions. right, I'll answer one of the so, questions with the story I okay, want to tell you about UPS. So, um, so uh, folks, folks in, our, in our online audience have been generously sending questions and voting on them. I'm going to begin with one. I'm going to begin with the most popular question, and then I'm going to invite anyone in the audience here um, there are microphones in the back of the room. You can, um, you can go jump in front of the mic, um, and if there's demand in the room, we'll alternate. Otherwise, we'll keep going online. So I'll start with the, uh, the question that has been voted up the most. Um, in Washington State, there has been an initiative that will implement an energy tax on pollution. What is your perspective on legislating sustainability? Andrew, I'll begin with you. Well, that that the army um, for you. Well, but that I think what they've designed in Washington is um, is smart. It's actually not uh, just a tax on energy. It's it's a you know a tax and well, they, what they proposed last year and didn't pass or two years ago was a um, tax and dividend, which is a structure that others have tried, which is you tax the energy and then you start giving money back to people, right? So that if their if their costs go up for driving, you're giving them the money back, and you and you tax less the things we want more of, like employment and and savings and the things we tax today. Um, they're doing more of a straight tax now, and I think they'll use some of the money for investing in renewables and other things. I, I think this is the right path. We've seen it work in British Columbia, which is right across the, the line for them. Um, and I think this is a good start, and I think it's gonna pass. Last I saw and talked to the folks behind it, it's, it's you know, got pretty good support in the polls. But, but on the other hand, Australia cr scraped its uh, uh, effort in this, and it doesn't seem to take hold in most of the rest of the world. Well, there's cap so, and trades and there's taxes, and cap and trades have had their ups and downs, cap, and cap there's taxes. We're gonna have a rule right. on questions. You each yeah. get to talk once, because we've got okay. a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, um, on the left. 
Yeah, um, this is a question for Andrew. Um, sure. I'm wondering, and this may sound strange, but um, what is your opinion about Darwinism and the survival of the fittest? And how it ties to business, are you saying? Or no, just... and how it ties to um, what appears to be the, the human <laughs> um, condition of, of not really acting in our own best interest. Yeah, well, there's a really interesting, um, there's a lot of really inter interesting history. It's, inter it's fascinating you ask this because um, there was a period of time where um, Darwinism kind of took over in politics and economics in the like 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, that range. There was, there's quite a bit of misinterpretation about what some of his work said. It, survival of the fittest was, was kind of one phrase that was picked out, but actually there's um, a tremendous amount of evidence in his own work and in many others, and including Adam Smith also that gets misused, that there's an awful lot of work in conjunction, that we work um, very often as a species. We wouldn't have survived very well versus animals with much sharper claws and, and greater speed without working well together. So there's, a, there's combination, right? We do have plenty of drives internally to um, achieve, to win, to beat others, but there's also this drive to bond, to comprehend, to work together. Um, and both of those things have made us successful as a species. So I think it's, it's partly been misinterpreted and was applied to economics in kind of a, an odd way. Because there are clearly ways that, that um, companies' value chains work together to this day in ways that are shared value or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. That's not a new concept. So um, yeah. I'm going to jump in with an yeah. online question, Yossi, and this one I think is directed to you. Um, what are the best ways to communicate the complexity of a company's sustainability strategy and its social impact, both internally and externally? It's a big question, so I'll just ask you to kind of summarize a few. What are the best ways to communicate? Well, you've talked about the importance of communicating what you're already doing, and I think what, yes. what, what we're looking for is to, something a little bit more specific than that. Perhaps. Well, people are, you know, companies are doing, companies who are not in the uh, B2C business, the B2B business mostly do a sustainability report. They do, you know, they... Uh, report about everything they do, and they hope that the NGOs and, and, you know, and the media will pick it up, and the Guardian always does, but uh, <laughs> aside from this, it's not, uh, um, to me, these are activities that are designed to make sure that they are not the nail that sticks out. That you, you know, what needs to be done, and by the way, what is the common denominator of all of these sustainability reports is they have long-term goals with not too many what we're going to do this year and next year. Mm -hmm. But they say, That's by true. 2030, we're going to cut something by 30%. That's true. Uh, which means three CEOs after me, there will be something, yeah. <laughs> something that will be done. And that's exactly what I'm saying. I understand it. It's rational for them to say something like this. Mm -hmm. And they do. So yes, they go through the, through the machinations of uh, um, I would say, I thought it was a pretending, it's too strong. Yeah. But uh, doing, doing some minimum, just not, to be, not, just not to be attacked, doing something easy so they can even communicate internally to their millennials that they're doing something and be you know, good citizens. But that's about it. Uh, sir. Well, controlling population is more than just an aside. Could you move away from the mic? It's just a tiny bit, yeah. Yeah, controlling population is more than just an aside. The UN has estimated that the population, mainly in Africa and Asia, will uh, continue to grow rapidly until at least 2050, but the climate analysis uh, projections show that we could go past the tipping point by 2040. Uh, now, can you actually ask or expect uh, developing countries uh, to forego development, or can you actually ask or expect the North to uh, make large transfers of wealth to the South uh, in order to uh, stabilize a more balanced uh, economy uh, that could uh, perhaps prevent these kinds I, of problems I, I, from reaching that point? I'm because population what? is a big factor, and we expect that the truism is economic development will take care of it, but that's racing past the time that we have to do something about climate change. That's true. Yeah, so the answer is no, you cannot do it. You cannot, you cannot ask people to stop, uh, you, you cannot instill population control. In our current way of thinking, it's, not, it's unethical and immoral. Uh, telling people, uh, unless you have a massive transfer of wealth from rich nation to developing world, which I think will be harder than a moonshot, because at least this will, you know, go, we're, we're investing in ourselves. Here we're investing with somebody that we don't even know. It doesn't look like us. Uh, it will be even harder to do. So I'm... You have one sentence on this one. Please, okay. please. Just one sentence, which is um, look at Project Drawdown and Educating Girls. Um, in this analysis of the ways we can tackle climate, 
this was kind of a surprise and really interesting finding. Educating girls is like the fifth or sixth highest, um, meaning that's what actually ends up seemingly effectively controlling population as you, as you raise the prospects for women around the world. Jason? Um, I, well, first of all, I just want to make a quick comment, which is I think there's a both and with the moonshot and the carbon price. In fact, they work, those two policies actually have a lot of synergies yes. between each other, so. That was my closing comment, so yeah. thank you. But, uh, <laughs> but the comment I wanted to make, and the question is, um, I feel like there's something that was bugging me listening to the conversation, and it was that um, I think we're looking at companies and individuals very atomistically, like each company making its own individual decisions rationally about what it's supposed to do, and each consumer making their decision individually about what they're supposed to do. And yet, what we've the one, one, one point of agreement here is that this is a tragedy of the commons. This is a collective action challenge. And so I'm just wondering what are, you know, and I think, you know, the, the Paris Accord was a huge achievement of 185 countries coming together for a collective action, you know, experiment. You know, what, what are the possibilities for kind of a less individualistic and a more collective way of looking at companies and industry associations joining together, for example, renewable energy commitments in the cloud industry led by Salesforce, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of the converse of what's happened with the Chamber of Commerce. You know, what do you see as the potential for that kind of more collaborative, more industry level or association level efforts? Um, I, look, that, that is happening. It's happening all over the place. Companies are trying to do these pre-competitive projects because they recognize that they have these problems they want to solve for their stakeholders for whatever set of reasons that they can't do alone, they can't justify it financially alone. So they do have these conversations. They haven't all been effective, of course, but there are a few really great examples. I think the Sustainability Consortium has been very good about gathering data, about footprints, about products, so you at least know where to act in your value chain. I think there's been the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, there's a Sustainable Fuels Buyers Alliance. There's groups that have come together and basically sent a message to all their suppliers and sometimes actually gone and changed technologies and said, we, we bring this much buying power. I, I think those are effective, but they're, I mean, look, they're incredibly difficult, right? Good, good collaborations are very difficult to manage um, and the incentive structures are very complicated. So it's not easy, but I think every company I know is working on a number of those at once and I think a lot of them fail, right? It's hard, to, it's hard to do it right, but there's been enough success that I find it pretty promising that we will, we will find it's, it's collaborations. Incredible. Just wanna add something of your book. You, yes. Excellent. I actually opened one page. <laughs> and, and I just happened to open the page that talk about uh, Puma. Mm -hmm. Puma was all over the European press because they did what the environmental profit and loss yeah, yeah. statement, how much they put money on how much they take from the from the environment, and they were celebrated all over, they did it. So we talked to a guy by the name of Stephen Seidel, who ran the supply chain program, an executive vice president of supply chain at Puma, and we asked him, okay, Stephen, so what was, we, we knew the answer, so what would be the biggest thing that you found out? So he found out that leather shoes have a huge impact because of the cattle and, you know, uh, methane. So what did you do? He said, nothing. Customers want leather shoes. So we did nothing. And in, in short, to me, this encapsulates everything. Because here is a company that actually tried to put together the money side and the environmental side by trying to cost how much resources and energy and whatever they take out of the environment and put the money. And they say, OK, a t-shirt costs, we sell it for, I don't know, seven euros. And Additional two euros, we should have said, because we take, this is the, the externality cost mm -hmm. of it. But at the end of the day, they basically did nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's all the consumers. Companies cannot do it unless consumers will demand and stop buying leather. Guess what happened? You think Puma will make leather shoes if consumers are not going to wear leather shoes? No, they won't. We have time for one very quick question. Sir. Um, how do you feel about nuclear? Because the Manhattan Project was a nuclear project. And I, I, I didn't it's nuclear. How do you feel about nuclear? Yeah. I think it's a, it's a travesty that the Greens are not pushing nuclear. I mean, it's a, it should be, well, the solution does, does, does not, you know, when I talk about the Manhattan Project, even the Manhattan Project will be a series of things. It's not going to be one thing. Yeah. There will be a series of technology and things. And uh, today on the table, nuclear has to be one of those. But if you see countries are just knee-jerk reaction, they say we're not, you know, we're not doing nuclear and all this. 
it's a problem because nuclear can take us at least until the Manhattan Project will have some, uh, it's a current technology and it can buy several years until maybe the Manhattan Project will bear fruit. So I think that uh, if you're really worried about uh, you know, climate change, you should have part of, port of, of your portfolio should be nuclear power. You want me to answer that too? If you have I'll quick, just say quickly quick that I think the economics would indicate building a new nuclear plant probably doesn't make any sense given the other options we have and just the insurance costs and everything. It's, it's, it's a very expensive thing to build, but we shouldn't shut any down. I think that was Germany's kind of big mistake. I understand the dangers of it and, and creating waste that lasts 10,000 years is immoral for the future, um, but it's zero carbon and we have no time. So we should keep them open as long as we possibly can. They should be the last to go. We should shut down coal, then natural gas, and then nuclear. Um, I'm going to invite you each to make a short closing statement. I guess Andrew went first to start, so Yossi, if you want. Short closing statement. Two minutes. I'll time you. OK. My statement will be, I want to ask the audience, how many of you buy stuff on Amazon? Uh, for those who cannot see, everybody raised their hand, and people who didn't raise their hand are lying. <laughs> so uh, everybody buys on Amazon, and out of everybody, 100% click on the two hours and two days delivery. None of you, statistics from, uh, from Amazon, even when, when you get financial incentive, none of you say, I'll order once every three weeks, get in one package, and minimize the transportation cost, of, not only transportation cost, but tra uh, transportation emissions. We will take these packages, we'll take all this cardboard and throw them into landfills and feel happy about it because it's convenient. What I'm saying at the end of the day, we're living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody uses Amazon, everybody fills landfills with lots of cardboards, everybody presses the two hours or you know, two days uh, button to get the, the free delivery. So if it is happening in Cambridge, think about Peoria. So that's where we are, and my message is, as long as we feel this way, and by the way, Amazon will be delighted if you do it once every month, because they, do, they give you free transportation. It's not free for Amazon. They would love you to, to, you know, to consolidate, and, but you don't. It's convenient. I do it myself, so hey but I'm not quite on the right side of the table. Um, so, <laughs> I, I do, so what I'm saying is, at the end, it's up to society, to consumers, to decide how to give the incentive to companies to react. Your two minutes, Andrew, say something optimistic. Sure, look, I, um, I have to say something optimistic. <laughs> it's I, your I two guess, minutes. I, I, you know, the, ki <laughs> the kidding and argument aside, I think um, we actually don't disagree on very much, which was originally this was set up as kind of a debate, and I said we're not gonna disagree on that much. Um, I think maybe just on the solution set, I think we probably have some disagreement, but I think it's what Professor Jay said, it's, um, it's all, we have to do all. The, the pace that we need now, given what we now know about where the climate is headed and our, and our ecosystems, um, we need all of it. We need moonshots, we need new, some new technologies, we need to pour capital into getting in place the technologies we already have. We need some consumer uh, change, but I would agree actually, when I said before investors were kind of 20th on the stakeholders, consumers are like 19th. I, I agree, consumers have not been the pressure. Oddly, B2B has been though, companies pressing each other, and when you dig into why, it does get muddy. If you say to a, Wal a Walmart, why are they pushing consumer products companies to shrink footprint, make better products, they say the consumer but they don't actually have that much evidence of it. No. So it's a very strange time we're in. There's just this increasing belief that the way we should operate um, is better, is more sustainable. That's a good thing. Norms change. It became the norm that we should try to get rid of child labor, right? Well, the, the norms do improve. I think this is something I do feel optimistic about. I think the clean economy is something I feel optimistic about. Um, the, the, the costs of clean technology have just plummeted at a pace that nobody expected, honestly. The International Energy Agency keeps predicting that it won't be as much renewables as it is. They keep getting it wrong every year, um, and it's growing very, very fast. So that's the good news. Um, I, I'd say, um, so I think we need all of these solutions. I think we need all of these factors and all of these players to, to change. Um, the last thing I'll just say is the election on Tuesday is the most important of our lives. I ask, you, <laughs> I ask you all to vote and to get other people to vote because the entire agenda we're talking about is not going to happen in a failing democracy. Um, we have to have a working democracy with people who actually support and vote for as representatives, vote for action on climate, including a price on carbon 
or whatever other incentives we can use. So we have to change who's in power. I'll leave it there. I want to thank you both very much. We opened with the question, is it up to business to save the planet? Have we answered that question definitively? No. Have we <laughs> talked about it? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yossi, Andrew, thank you thank both you. very much. Um, those of you here, thank you. Those watching online, thank you. Thank you, sir.